times when circumstances make perfect sense to us as we try to
And I don't think, I don't think ever a song has spoken so much to me like that song. And uh, it's just uh, beautiful. Thank you girls for singing it and uh, presenting it so beautiful. There are, there are times when the Lord speaks to your heart and that song really, really spoke. And that's beautiful. Okay? Well, I'm glad to be with you tonight. Or today. It's not night yet. And uh, I hope that as we share time together, the Lord will bless us. Let us pray our again. Our gracious Father, we thank you that we have you as our God. And that, Lord, you consider us your, your children and that you love us as such. We thank you, Father, that we can come to you openly and that, Lord, we can speak to you as a friend. And, Lord, uh, tonight as we open the Scriptures, we come to you, Lord, as little children to be taught and to request of you, Father, that you will enable us to hear you and to see you. We pray, dear Lord, that your Spirit will speak to us, for he is the great teacher. And we request that, Lord, the promise will be fulfilled, that he will guide us into all truth. As Jesus is exalted before our eyes, we pray, Lord, that you will make me the medium that you have chosen this afternoon. That you will make me like a rusty nail, nailed on the wall, where you will hang the most precious picture of Jesus. So that no one will fix their eyes upon me, but that everyone will see Christ. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. I grew up in the country of Chile until the age of 19. I finished my, my high school there. and When I was 18 years of age, the Lord called me to, to be a minister. And I grew up in a, in a poor setting. We lived in a, in a farm. Well, since, my, since I was five years of age, we were nine brothers and sisters, six born, three adopted, and two, well, we were 11, but the other ones were too old, too, uh, you know, a lot older than us. And um, in Chile, bread is very important. If you have to eat bread in every, in every meal. Any Chileans here? No, yeah, I'm the only Chile. That's, that's right. Oh, no, you're not Chile, sister. Oh, you're not bread, okay. If you're Italian, or then you'll understand what's happening. But in Chile, bread is for Asians like rice. I've been to Indonesia, and, uh, you know, and, and, and you eat rice in every meal, don't you? And if you don't have your rice, it's as if you're not eating. Well, in Chile, if you don't have bread, it's as if you haven't eaten. I remember it was a master bit about seven or eight. And uh, we ran out of bread at home, and we didn't have, have flour to make bread. And my dad was in town. We lived in a farm, and about 20 kilometers away was town. And my dad didn't come, and my mom made dinner, and we ate dinner. And she gave us second, and we went full, and she gave us more food. And at the end, we ran out of food, and uh, there was nothing else to give us. Nine kids, imagine, you know. There's nine mouths to fill, and dad wasn't coming with the bread, and we weren't satisfied. We ate and ate, and then we, it's, well, it's, it's not the same, because it, here in the Australia, bread is it's not the same as in Chile. Chile, the Chile bread is nice. And, uh, and uh, no, it's true, Chilean bread is bread, you know, it's, it's just something different. They make Chilean bread here, it's not the same, it's as if the flour is something missing. And so I don't eat so much bread here, but in Chile, bread is. I remember I, I was little, and uh, I, I had to stay back one day and, uh, at, at school because I used to be a goalkeeper and my career as a goalkeeper I, I ended up when I, I, I hit a, a referee. I, I was very bad tempered. And, uh, but then this time after training, I was so hungry, so hungry. And for about five cents you could buy a break. But I didn't have five cents. I was poor. And I remember walking, waiting for the bus. Must have been about five or one in the afternoon. The bus came at six and looking into the bakery. <laughs> And the bread was given. In Chile, they bake bread twice a day. You can buy hot bread in the morning and hot bread, and bread in the afternoon around five. You can buy hot bread again. So the, 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 you walk out of a bakery, and you're outside of a bakery, and the smell of bread is, is like heaven. But when you don't have the money, it's like hell. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, it, it was hard. I didn't have the money. You know, we were poor. We, I grew up with uh, hand-me-down clothes. 
and uh, the hand-me-down clothes uh, came from a nephew who was fat and two, older, two years older than me, and he had a big foot. And I remember once they gave me a pair of sun shoes, and I was so glad because uh, at home they used to buy, buy us only once a year shoes. And those shoes were for church and for school. And they had to last you a year because there was no money to buy any more shoes. And so my, my, my nephew gave me this pair of sandals and I was so happy. But they were about this much bigger than my foot. What do you do with a shoe that is that much bigger? So in order to tie them down when I played soccer, I used to uh, tie them with a normal cord and then I would get another cord and tie them just like this, around like that. And then one day playing soccer, I hit the ball and the shoe flew. <laughs> And, uh, and the air, all the kids laughed, and that made me stronger. You know, the, the, it's not fun being poor. It's true, isn't it? We came to Australia, and uh, Australia for us was like Canaan for the Israelites. Uh, and and I, I thank God for Australia every day of our life. I, lo I love Chile, but Australia is a blessed country. It's truly a land where flow, that, that flows with milk and honey. It's a blessed country. And... Um, Though we were poor, we never considered ourselves poor. But as I look back, it's not fun to be poor, is it? Poverty can be very cruel. And um, the Bible says that in the last days, oh, you know that human beings are actually poor. Come with me to the book of Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. He's speaking to, to a church. To the church that lives in the last days. This church has a problem. Chapter 3 of the Revelation will read from verse 14. And to the angel of the church of, Laodice, of the Laodiceans write, This thing says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your words. That you are neither cold nor hot, I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And now comes the problem of the church. The, the fact that this church is cold, neither cold nor hot, is a symptom, is not the problem of the church. Now comes the problem of the church. The problem of this church, and this church represents Christianity in the, in the last days, it says, because you say, I am rich, and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. But that is the problem, that is the, 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 the disease of this church. It says that she says, she says, I am rich, I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. And then Jesus says this to her, he says, and do not know that you are wretched, Miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I want to I want to uh, experience, uh, uh, investigate a little bit this. Uh, the Bible says that the real situation of this group of people, the real situation is that they are miserable, wretched, poor, blind, and naked. Why are they like that? You know, what, what a dreadful situation. Uh, and, and, and I, you know, and I saw in Chile, I, I used to go to a very poor school. It was a government school, and all of us were poor there, so we all thought we were fine. But they were poor, poor kids that believed that they were rich. And it was miserable, because they, they, they tried to live something that in reality they were not. And then is, that's the problem of this, of this church. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to take the, the time to investigate this, this message, but I just want to use it as a springboard. Poor. What does, what does the Bible mean when we are poor? Why are we poor? As a matter of fact, that is the reality of all humanity, not only of this church. The problem with this church, it is, it, it is being blinded so that it no longer sees its poverty, but it considers itself rich. You know, my, my brother was funny. My, the brother that comes before me, he was ashamed of being poor. And, uh, and in, 19, in, in 1981, my brother was diagnosed with a brain tumor. 
and, uh, and he was operated, and being poor, and Chile, you know, um, um, uh, medicine is very expensive, and to go through the operation, not only we were poor, but we were left with a lifetime debt. It was massive. But the, my brother, the Lord, he, he, he recovered, he went through the operation, he recovered, and now my mother looked after him like, a, you know, with cotton, because he was, he had been so close to death. And so, whatever little bit of money we would have, my mother would buy him something special, special clothes, more expensive things, and we understood, we kids, none of us were jealous, we understood, it was fine, and we were so happy he was alive, but my brother developed the rich man's mentality. <laughs> and I remember once we were outside the farm hitchhiking, and my brother was just a few meters down hitchhiking, he wasn't hitchhiking with us, we were going to school, the bus had gone, and we were hitchhiking to, to, to school, and my brother was just down there, and suddenly he, a, a car stopped for him. And, and the driver asked, asked those kids <laughs> if they were going, he was our brother, and he, uh, he, he screamed at us and said, hey, you, where are you going? Are you coming down too? Because he didn't, he didn't like to associate with us, because we dressed so funny, as you know, being poor, and he dressed you know, with more expensive clothes. So he had the, the, the rich man's mentality, the syndrome of being rich when he was poor. That is the problem of that church. <laughs> and so the reality is, friends, when we look at the scriptures, is that we are poor. Humanity is poor. We are miserable. We are wretched. We are blind. We are poor. And we are naked. In reality, we have nothing. In the book of Romans, Paul explains to us why we are in this condition. In the book of Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, Paul says this, For all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. You know, when we, when we look at this situation uh, and, uh, and, 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 and you understand, Adam and Eve, the moment they sinned, they lost everything. They became poor. And it was illustrated by their nakedness. True? Before that, they were covered in glory. They had a, a, a covering of glory. The glory of God, His beauty, actually covered them. And that represented the fact that they were rich. They were glorious. They had everything. They were children of God. They, they carried His image. The whole world was theirs. They were heirs of God. The moment they sinned, the glory left and they were left. <laughs> they were naked. They were ashamed of each other. They tried to come and now they found wonderful coverings. They covered themselves in leaves. They were poor. A physical reality that showed the spiritual reality. And in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says that uh, all have sinned and fall short. That word, fall, that word fall short can literally be translated and they have become void of the glory of God. They do not have it. So what are we poor of? The glory of God. We don't have it. What is glory in the Bible? It's a symbol of character. We lost that which was our richness. In the scriptures, that which makes you truly rich is not a big house, is not money in the bank, is not the car you drive, is not your status, your position in society. What makes you rich is character. That is true riches. Real wealth is character. The Bible says that we lost it. The moment we sinned, we lost it. And every time we sin, we lose something else from us. Yes or no? Sin is a deceiver. Sin is a robber. It's a robber of who you are. Sin promises you to make you feel better, promises to give you power, promises to give you freedom. But when you fall in the trap, it takes away everything that promised, and even more, it leaves you bankrupt. Doesn't matter if they legalize sin, if the politicians tell you that it's alright, if society tries to convince you that it's okay, in your soul you know that every time you
you do that which is wrong, there is something inside you lose. Yes or no? There's no one. No one needs to convince you that sin is a robber. It destroys you. It breaks you. It shatters you. It enslaves you. Yes or no? Yes. So true. And yet we fall for it every Every one of us have seen. Therefore, all of us are poor. We are naked. We are blind. We are miserable. We are wretched. True? How can I get out of it? In the book of Revelation, we are given the solution. The Bible always gives us the solution. You know that the Bible is the only book that gives you a solution? Revelation chapter 3 gives you a solution. And I want to talk about that solution today. People bag the Bible. Science bag the Bible. But I tell you, science with all of the bagging of the Bible and all that the, the arguments they use for there being no God, science has never given a solution to the poverty of humanity. Philosophy cannot satisfy the hunger of your soul. Position, power, forget it. We've all tried it. When, when is the solution to our problem? There is only one place and there is only one book. The Quran doesn't give it to you. Hinduism doesn't offer it. Buddhism doesn't. Only the book of Christians gives you a solution. The Bible. Amen? Amen? The Bible and the Bible alone. And here is the solution. The solution. In, in, in verse 18 says, verse 18 of chapter 3, I counsel you to buy of me. Go refine the fire that you may be rich. White garments that you may be clothed and the, sh and the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eyes out that you may may see as many as I love I will do that and chasten therefore be zealous and repent who is the solution where did you find the solution Jesus says I counsel you to buy from me who has the riches that we need it's Christ in Christ is the solution to our problem you may have come broken hearted you may have come to this place feeling your nakedness ashamed guilty you, you, you may know how lost you are. You may, may be looking for answers to your life, you know, to, to your, the questions in life, and you have searched and searched and found them nowhere. You come to the right place. Christ alone has the solution to the sin sick soul. Christ alone. He says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. You know, the beautiful thing is that Christ invites the poor to come and eat and drink for free. You know, at school they used to give us biscuits and, and hot milk every morning. That was a gift from the government. Pinochet did good things. And I, we used to love it. La, you know, in Chile, in winter gets pretty cold. Minus five, ten, uh, you know, minus five degrees Celsius. And, and uh, I remember going to school, you know, and that it, 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 it was very cold, and we were shivering, our hands were, 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 were frozen. So uh, at school, we would do physical education, and after that, we would have to shower with cold water in the middle of, uh, in the middle of uh, winter. By the time we finished having our shower, we would go to class, and we couldn't write because our hands were frozen. And so we would look forward to breakfast at school. We, we would have a good breakfast at night. We always ate well at night. But then it came time for breakfast at school and they give us three biscuits, this big. They were yummy. And a cup of hot milk. Oh man, that was heaven. The school had the solution to our problem and we loved it. Jesus is the solution to our problem. Doesn't matter what you go through, doesn't matter what your tendencies are, doesn't matter what enslaves you, Christ is the solution. In Him alone is the answer. And I want to show you why. Come with me to the book of Colossians. Colossians.
chapter chapter 3, chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1. And we'll take it from verse 15. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15, the apostle writes, He, that's Jesus. Chapter 1 of Colossians, verse 15. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of our all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Jesus is God. He is our creator. You are here because of him. You are kept together because of Jesus. Jesus is the great power that holds the atom together. Christ. Verse 17, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Then verse uh, 19, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. Can you notice the, the, the superlatives that Paul is using? He is using words to show us that Christ is everything, that He is the head, that He is the creator, He is the beginning, He is the end, He is, He has the preeminence on all things, He is the fullness of all things. Amen. Can you notice that? And then Paul says, and by Him to reconcile all things to Himself, by Him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. So Christ is our reconciliation. He is our peace. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, you now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless, blameless above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature in the heaven of which I, Paul, became a minister, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill, my, uh, fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. What is that mystery? To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. The gospel carries a mystery. Some people think that the gospel is the mystery. No, the gospel brings a mystery. And that mystery has been hidden throughout the ages. It had been kept a secret and it was revealed with the death of Christ. What is that mystery? Now comes this mystery. It says in verse um, 27, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. Christ in us is the hope of what? Glory. That which we lost. That which we lost for sin. We traded our glory for sin. We lost it, was gone. We lost our right to breathe, to drink water, to eat. We lost our right to live. We lost our right to everything when we sinned. We lost our glory. Our character was gone. gone. That which we re recommended us to God was taken away. We were left hopelessly lost and there was nothing you and I could obtain it, to do to obtain it. And it says here, that Christ in me is the hope of that glory. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. You and I in Christ can receive the riches we lost. And then it says, Him we preach, warning everyone, every man and every, and every man, and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. 
To this end, I also labor, striving to his working, which works in me mightily. And then I want you to come and read verse chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. That their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the fullness assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, and notice now it says, in whom this is Christ are hidden all, all the treasures. Did you hear that? A poor man needs treasures. True? In order to be rich physically, a poor man needs treasures. And the Bible says that there was a man who was digging in a field and he found a treasure when he was digging. Could you imagine that? He was digging and suddenly there was a hidden treasure that he found. And when he found it, what did he do? Sold everything. He covered it and then he went and sold everything he had and purchased the field in order to have the treasure. Christ is the treasure. In him are hidden all the treasures. And the Bible here speaks of wisdom. But not only of wisdom. Let me show you what other treasures are hidden in Christ. Come to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verses 29 and 30. It says that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him. You are in Christ Jesus. Because of Jesus, we belong to God the Father again. But of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us. Christ. This is what Christ is to us. What is it? Wisdom from God. And? And? Righteousness. And? Sanctification. And? Redemption. That He who glories, let Him glory in the Lord, the Bible says. What is Jesus for us? Jesus is everything we need for our salvation. Amen. 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 Everything that we need to receive that glory back, everything we need to stand in the presence of God, everything we need, dear friends, to be freed from the control and the mystery of sin is found in Christ. He is our treasure. He is the pearl of great price. His worth, He is worth exchanging everything you are and have for. Because in Christ are hidden all the treasures. He is our all. Amen. John, speaking of Jesus, says, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. I'm going to change that a little bit. He who has the Son has everything. He who does not have the Son has nothing. The worst deception that can happen, even when you're a Christian, is to believe that you're rich in yourself. That because of certain duties you fulfill, or because of certain actions you do, or for certain set of beliefs you follow, then you have become a good person, then you have been deceived. It was the great deception that blinded the Jews to their need of Jesus. When Christ came, the treasure from heaven, the creator of the universe, in whom everything is sustained and in whom all the treasures of the universe are contained. When God gave His Son, He gave everything. In the gift of His Son, all of the universe was contained. Everything we would ever need had been contained in Christ. And yet, the Jews, when they looked at Christ, they saw no beauty, no attraction for them. He was like a, a, a root out of dry ground. They felt no need for the Savior. They did not run to Him. They did not need Him. They did not crave Him. Why? Jesus became a stumbling block for the Jews. Why? Because they believed they were rich. They didn't know. But they were poor, miserable, blind, and naked. 
And that is the problem of that last church. The problem is that that last church, like the Jews, believe they are good, believe they, they are better than others, because they follow a set of duties and doctrines and beliefs. They think that they are rich and Christian goods. You know, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the apostle speaks of our Christ in these words. Chapter 5, or chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I love these words. That though he was rich, he had that glory. He was like the Father, the same level. He was equal with the Father. He did not count it as robbery to be equal with God, the Bible says. And then it says these amazing words. He says that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became, he became poor. In other words, friends, for, for our sakes, Jesus abandons his reality and he takes our reality. I was quite happy to abandon the reality that I had to come to a better reality in Australia. But Jesus abandoned his reality to take on our reality. He abandoned the glory of the Father to come to a world where there was no glory. He became a human. He was born as a poor human in the midst of a poor family. And dear friends, he lived as a one who had nowhere to place his head. And when he died, he died naked. Like Adam and Eve when they sinned. Wow. What a mighty Savior we have. He saw your poverty and he says, I cannot, I cannot let them die. I cannot see them lost. Father, I will take their place. I will buy their poverty with my own blood. Wow. And at Calvary, our poverty was laid on him. All of our sins were placed upon the substitute. Glory, hallelujah for a substitute. Amen. 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 What a mighty gift we have in our substitute. And he became poor. He lost his glory. The Father forsook him. The Spirit left him. And he received the punishment that you and I deserve for our sins. And at Calvary, it could be written, for he sinned. And he was void of the glory. Wow. He became poor. Why did he become poor? Well, the verse says it next. He became, for your sakes, he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Wow. I love that. Amen? Amen. Don't you love that? Our God became poor. He took our poverty. He purchased it with his blood. He became guilty. He was punished for it so that you and I no longer need to remain poor. But he doesn't want us to consider ourselves rich because of the things we do. He wants us to take on him. And when we take on him, then we become rich in the eyes of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Don't you say hallelujah? This is a hallelujah, amen. Man, what a glorious, simple way in which God solves the problem of poverty. You know that you can solve physical poverty okay, by taking someone and giving them the lotto, they become physically rich. But that doesn't solve 
the spiritual poverty. As a matter of fact, it made, made them even worse poor. But Christ, and you take hold of Christ. Notice what happens in the book of Colossians, chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. And verse 10, I love this, this word. This is probably one of my favorite texts in the scriptures. It gives me so much assurance. Because I know my poverty. I know that without Christ I am a slave of sin. I have ceased to trust in myself. There's nothing I can do of myself to lift myself from the boots out of the problem of sin. Christ is my own. And when I am in Christ, notice what it says, verse 10, and you are, what is the next word? Complete. In who? In Him. Who is the head of all principalities and power. When I am in Christ, what am I? What is the result of it? You may be the worst of sinners, but if, Christ, if you call upon Christ and you take hold of Him as your Savior, if you let Him take you by your arms and enfold you and bring you to yourself, dear friends, in the eyes of God, you are complete, you are rich. You are no longer gloryless, you are full of the glory because Christ is your glory. Amen? Amen. If there is one thing we have to do, is to trust in Jesus. Turn away from trusting and looking at yourself. The picture is too poor. It's too wretched. It's a miserable picture. Stop measuring yourself. Stop trying to be good. Stop trying to play at Christian, being a Christian. Stop it. Turn to Christ and say to him, Lord of myself, I can't do it. Accept your poverty. Notice what Matthew 5 says. Matthew 5. There are some times I was preaching once and I said, I read these verses in Luke. In Luke is more straightforward. Matthew 5, here in verse 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Luke says, Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor, I used to ask, how can you say blessed are the poor when poverty creates bitterness, creates anger, when poverty creates jealousy, why do you say blessed are the poor? Because, friends, the world has taught us to be ashamed of, of poverty. God wants us to consider ourselves blessed when we come to the realization of how poor we are. When you hit the rock bottom and you realize that you're a failure, that you cannot achieve it, that you have nothing, that everything around you is falling, that you cannot do it on your own, then heaven looks at you and says, you are happy, you are blessed. How can that be? Because there's, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, the beginning of the road to recovery, the beginning of the road to eternal life, it's found when you and I come to the realization of our poverty. If you came today with the realization that you have failed and that you have failed God many times, if you have a consciousness of your sinfulness, of how guilty you are, and how unable you are to fix yourself, I call you blessed. Speaking once with a woman who came to me broken hearted, and she was, she was a mess. For two hours she told me her life, horrible life. Then I looked at her and said, you're blessed. And she looked at me and says, can't you tell me, that? how can you tell me that I'm a mess, uh, that I, you know, I'm blessed when I am in a mess, how can you say that? And then I explained the gospel to her. And dear friends, if you came here thinking that you're fine, that you're a good Christian, that you're better than others, then you're cursed. You know, in only a few months, that woman stopped using drugs, stopped using alcohol, stopped using cigarettes. When she realized that in the eyes of God, she was blessed. Because now, he could help her. In Christ, you have everything.
If you're hungry for a better life, if you want to change, if you no longer want to be the person you are, the Lord says, blessed. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. If you are crying because of your sins, if you're in a mess and you can cannot sleep at night because your life is a mess and you're crying, the Lord says, blessed are you because I will comfort you. In Christ is a solution for all our problems. Why? Because Christ is our all. Amen? Amen. I wonder if there's anyone here who would like to say to Jesus, Jesus, I am poor. I am wretched. I am miserable. I am naked. But I want to make you my own. Mm-hmm. If that is your desire, would you stand where you are that we may pray together? Let's pray. Our glorious Father, we stand before you in full recognition of our poverty our need, our wretchedness, our misery. Dear Lord, we stand before you, for you have invited us, and at this very moment you are calling us blessed, for ours is the kingdom of heaven. Many of us have cried because of our inabilities, our incapacity, Father, to overcome. We have failed so many times. We have promised and promised, and our promises have come nowhere. Father, we stand for you to console us and for you to do the work that you need to do in our lives. Father, many of us stand because we want to stop being the people we are. We want to be like Jesus. But we cannot obey ourselves. You have promised that you will satisfy us. Dear Lord, we stand. For though we are wretched, poor, miserable, blind and naked, in Christ you have given us the treasure we need. He is our treasure. He is the pearl of great price. Oh, how much we need him and how little attention we pay to him. Lord, please. As as we stand in this moment, I pray, Lord, that you will enable us to take hold of Jesus and to account ourselves as rich in him, complete in our Savior, perfect in him, who is our own. Thank you for doing it, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.